Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together, preparing ourselves for the Bible study tonight. I want you to close your eyes and pray that the Lord himself will speak to your heart tonight at the Bible study. God will keep you intelligent, wise, alert, and interested, enthusiastic to hear his word. And that his word will bring real riches of heaven into your heart tonight. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Pray that you'll not be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that studied the word a lot, but you never saw Christ in the word they studied. They only saw their tradition. And the words they learned never affected their hearts. They read the words, but they closed their minds. They closed their eyes. They deadened their consciences. They studied the truth, but they held the truth in unrighteousness. You want to pray that God will help you. You'll not be a hardened Pharaoh, a hardened Nebuchadnezzar, a profligate Belshazzar. You'll not be a hardened Herod. You'll not be a Judas Iscariot that heard every message and every sermon and every statement that Jesus made and yet was lost. Pray that God will soften your heart, will open up your heart to receive what the Lord has to teach us. Pray that this word of God will turn you around, convert you, change you, transform your life, so that day by day, As you hear the word, as you study the word, God will make you wiser, you'll grow higher, you'll get deeper into Christ. And the word of God, like water cleansing, washing, purging, purifying, or wash and purge and purify your heart and your life. And pray that your neighbors will see the effect of the word, the influence of the word in your life. Pray that you yourself will be able to tell, once I was blind, now I see. You'll be able to see the change, the transformation in your life. You'll give glory to God and you'll say, the word is changing me. Pray that your coming will not be in vain. Your efforts, your dedication, your commitment... Your regular attendance of the Bible study will not be in vain. Pray that this scripture of truth will be so much implanted in your life, and you will be planted by the rivers of water, and you'll bring forth your fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. In its season, by the word you learn, and in the time of temptation and trial, in the time of trouble and persecution, this word will come to your remembrance and will bear you up above the waves, above the storms, and above all the circumstances and situations you find yourself in. In terms of loneliness, the word will be your companion. 
in times of conflict, the word will bring solution and resolution. In times of weariness and discouragement, the word will bring encouragement. In times of despair, the word will bring strength, courage. In times of persecution, the word will bring support, sustenance in your life. In times when you come to the crossroads, the word will shed the light and say, This is the way. Walk ye therein. In times of trial, the word will lead you into triumph. And when Satan comes with all his tricks, you remember like Jesus did and say, it is written, and the written word will grant you the success the conquering spirit that you ought to have. Pray that God will give you another heart, not the heart of Belshazzar, not the mind of Belshazzar, and pray that you will not be among those who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But this truth or present prominent and preeminent in your life. And you'll be able to stand, stand firm, steadfast in the day of trial. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Bible study. What a wonderful time. Always a joy. To be together with other children of God and then to listen to you, to hear your word coming down like dew and rain upon the heart of everyone. Lord, we pray you refresh the heart of every person today in Jesus' name. We pray for our brothers and sisters and all the other Bible study locations and sites. Those who are listening, those who are watching. Lord, we pray as we are blessing us here, you'll bless them abundantly in Jesus' name. We pray that you put everything behind us so that, Lord, your word will be before us. And then you'll grant us the wisdom and then the strength to be able to have the grace to face the challenges that may be ahead of us. Help us, Lord, to learn, to think, to meditate, to apply, to believe the word of God and to lay by the word every moment of our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the Lord hear your amen before you sit down. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're coming back to Daniel. What a wonderful book we have. Daniel. And somebody was talking to me and was saying, now we're in study 20, I think that time it was 23. And we're just in chapter 5. And then he was wondering, when are we going to finish? I said, it's not when you finish that matters. It's not just to run through. You see, there are people that cover a lot of ground. But they never dig deep into the soil. And although they cover ground, they do not get the minerals and the oil that is there in the soil, hidden for them. There are mysteries here, there are treasures here, there are precious things here. That's why the Lord is taking us step by step and study after study and chapter after chapter and verse after verse. I pray that the Lord will give you all the treasures in his word as we study in Jesus' name. We come to Matthew, this, we come to this Daniel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. Daniel chapter 5, verse 25. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many to kill you for sin. This is the interpretation of the sin. Many, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. 
Tekel, thou art wage in the balance seas and art found wanting. Paris, by the way, you see that it says she for seen in uh, verse 25, and then it says Paris in verse 28. One of those words you have the plural, and in the other you have the singular. And that's why you find that difference is still the same word, but one is singular and the other one is plural. It says in verse 28, Paris, that kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes, the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar that they closed and they closed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldean slain and Darius the Median took the kingdom. Being about three score and two, two years old. That's what we're looking at tonight. I just want to remind you that Belshazzar was alive when the judgment came upon his father, Nebuchadnezzar. But he did not take note. He did not learn from what had happened unto his father, the Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar was deliberately ignorant, intentionally ignorant, adamantly ignorant, and stiff-neckedly ignorant, wholeheartedly ignorant of the true God. He knew the truth. He rejected the truth. He abandoned the truth. He neglected, overlooked the truth. He knew that God, the living God, and the true God in heaven is not an indulgent God. That is a God who judges sin. And yet, deliberately, intentionally, you see what he did? He did something that God had to judge. And he was also not ignorant of what the Lord had done. And of the prophecies that had gone on before. But he closed his mind. He closed his eyes and deliberately went on in sin. And the other time we looked at the Romans, we looked at this, Daniel chapter 5, we saw that he had the superfluity of naughtiness in him. And because of that superfluity of naughtiness, that's how the great judgment came upon him. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, and I'm reading to you there from verse 19. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. Because that, that will be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. That which may be known of God was manifest unto them. Unto Belshazzar, it was manifest, but he rejected the truth. He neglected the truth. He overlooked the truth. He jettisoned the truth. Just said, I don't have anything to do with that. That happened to my father, Nebuchadnezzar. That's all right for him. As for me, I'm going to be a man of my own mind. Look at that verse 19 again. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Belshazzar was without excuse. He, in his ignorance, deliberate ignorance, he had disregarded God, dishonored God, his creator. He lived carelessly without thinking of the end. And you ought to always think about the end, about the consequence of what you do. We're told in Deuteronomy, the path of wisdom. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, I'm reading verses 28 and 29. Deuteronomy chapter 32, we're looking at verse 28 and verse 29. It says, For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. How do we know there was no understanding in them? Oh, that they were wise. 
and that they had understood this, that they would consider their latter end. And that's why we're coming to study, we're coming to think about our latter end. What shall it be at the end? What shall it be when the Lord will call us home one by one? What shall it be when death shall come? And if death knocks at the door, are you ready? Are you prepared for the coming of the Lord? But she had no thought of his latter end. But his ignorance was inexcusable. The prophecies concerning the destruction of Babylon and the end of the king of Babylon and the mighty men of Babylon, those uh, prophecies were so numerous and specific. Let me just show you a few of them. In Isaiah, open your Bible. Isaiah chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 17. Isaiah chapter 13. We're looking at verse 17. If he had only read the Bible, if he had only asked the prophet Daniel, if he had only considered the reaching word of God, he wouldn't have done what he did. He would have known that judgment was coming. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 13, verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the maidens against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Can you see there, the Lord even mentions specifically the maidens. In verse 19, it says, And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms. The beauty of the Chaldean's, ex Chaldean's excellency shall be as when God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, the word of God is very clear, very plain. In Isaiah chapter 14, reading from verse 22. For I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and the remnant and the son and the nephew, says the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the beaten and pools of water. I will sweep it with the basin of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so it shall stand. You see that God said, I've determined I'm going to destroy Babylon. I've purposed it, I've determined it, and it's going to be so. If this man Belshazzar had only taken time to listen, to read the word of God, he would have known that judgment was coming on Babylon. He wouldn't have played with his life. Jeremiah chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon. Could anything be more clear, could be more specific, that God, the Almighty God said that after 70 years of captivity of the children of Israel in Babylon, I am going to punish Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual, perpetual destruction. You know, it's so clear and Belshazzar should have read that. He wouldn't have just judged or gambled with his future, with his life, and with eternity too. In Jeremiah chapter 50, I'm reading from verse 45. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 45. Therefore, hear ye the counsel of the Lord, that he has taken against Babylon, and his purposes, that he has purposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. You see that again? It was very clear that God was going to bring judgment upon Babylon. Well, I need something here. Everything God wants to do, he is reaching in his word. And the end of the world that is coming is reaching in the word. The judgment that will come upon sinners, upon unbelievers, upon backsliders, all that is reaching in the word. The eternity of darkness, eternity of suffering, eternity of hell, 
hellfire that is awaiting the unbeliever, the sin all over the world. The Bible is very clear about that. And the man of wisdom and the woman of wisdom will look and then be intelligent and say, Hey, it says God said this is what he will do. He will do it. And therefore, I need to take care. He said he was going to destroy the, time, the world at the time of Noah. He warned them ahead of time. He did it. He said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He warned them ahead of time and he did it. He said he was going to destroy Babylon. He warned them ahead of time and he did it. And he's not told us he's going to destroy the world with fire. He has warned us ahead of time and we need to take heed to the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 51. In Jeremiah 51, I'm reading from verse 28 and verse 29. Jeremiah chapter two, chapter 51 verse 28 it says prepare against her the nations with the kings of the medes the captains thereof and all the rulers thereof and all the land of his dominion and the land shall tremble and sorrow for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed. Every purpose of the Lord shall be performed. Every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. The Lord cannot be blamed. If anybody, after hearing the warning, will close his mind and close his heart and then will dead in his conscience against the watch of God. His destruction will be his own fault. As the Lord is revealing his truth to us, I pray that every one of us will be wise unto salvation in Jesus' name. Now we're going to divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the irreversible fate of an unrighteous person. The fate, the end, the calamity, the destruction, the condemnation that is irreversible. That God has said, this is my purpose and it will be done. We're looking at number two, the immediate fulfillment of an unchangeable prophecy. Immediate fulfillment of an unchangeable prophecy. You'll find in the Bible that this destruction of Babylon had been prophesied by Isaiah, by Jeremiah, by Ezekiel, and now we're even told by Daniel. And all these prophecies concerning the destruction of Babylon, God said, this is going to be fulfilled. And now today we're reading about that immediate fulfillment of the unchangeable prophecy. Number three, the inevitable future of all unconverted people. The inevitable future of all unconverted people. Go back to number one, Daniel chapter five. In Daniel chapter five, we're reading from verse 25 all through to verse 28. And this is the writing that was written, many, many, take you for sin. This is the interpretation of the thing, many, God has numbered thy kingdom and has finished it. Take hell, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting, parents, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. The wise men of Babylon could not reach, neither could they interpret the writing on the wall. And as we think about the modern world in which we live, the men of the world, the wise men, the scientific men, the psychological people, the, psycho the psychologists, and the philosophical people, the philosophers, the two, they cannot read the signs, prophetic signs on the horizon. Daniel was the only man in Babylon who could read and interpret the writing and his interpretation. And that writing and interpretation was very certain, was very sure. 
Can you look up a moment? You know the people of the world, they take refuge in the majority. They say, if the majority is like this, then there must be some security if you take refuge in the majority. If the majority is ignorant, then we can join them and be ignorant of the majority. Do you know at this time, it was only one man, single man, solitary man, Daniel, that knew the writing. He was in the minority. The rest of the people were in the majority. And the majority was ignorant and wrong. And this man, not taking refuge in the majority, he was the only right person. You know, sometimes you look at the Bible and it appears that you are the only one among many people interpreting the Bible correctly. And you believe that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And everybody else interprets the Bible another way. And sometimes you begin to wonder, even our children, our teenage children, they begin to ask us, Daddy, Mommy, do you think that we in the minority emphasizing holiness, emphasizing sanctification. Do you think that we, the minority, will be right? Because the majority of the church people and religious people, they are on the other side. My boy, my girl, understand. It's always been the minority that knew the mind of God. In the time of Noah, it was the minority that escaped. In the time of Lord, it was minority that escaped. In the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a minority that knew that this is the Christ. And then at the end of the world, Jesus said, when the Son of Man shall come, shall he find faith on the earth? Is a minority that will stand on the truth. That's the reason why you don't want to worry about, you know, the majority going that direction. And the majority is doing this and doing that. Stay with the minority. Stay with Daniel. And stay with the word of God. And the Lord will see you through in Jesus' name. And when Daniel came, Daniel did not bother. That was in the minority. You know, sometimes today there are some preachers, it bothers them in their city. You know, they're they are the only one preaching faith and salvation and clean living and righteousness and holiness. And sometimes temptation will come and will say, now you are standing in a minority. All the religious groups don't agree with you. And don't you feel lonely? No. One person with Christ is in the majority. One person with the Bible, that's the majority. And one person that has the Holy Ghost with him as a comforter, the counselor, and the teacher, that's the majority already. And one person that's on his way to heaven, we don't want to follow the majority of the world. And so Daniel came. And Daniel was the only one, and he read it, many, many, take a you for sin. Then he interpreted it. It was very sure and definite. There was no uncertainty or doubt in his heart or, or doubt in his tone. He said many. He began to give the meaning, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. He said, Belshazzar, I know you are young and you're not thinking of death. You're not still as old as Nebuchadnezzar, your father. But because of what you did, the negative prophets will be fulfilled on you. And now your life is cut short. Look at Psalm 55. I'm reading from verse 23. Psalm 55, verse 23. But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. Bloody and deceitful men, defiled men, and profligate people, profane men, shall not live half their days. He shouldn't have died the time he died, but he cut short his life because of his wickedness. And that's why the writing came. God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. He died prematurely because of his wickedness. 
because of his iniquity, because of his profanity, and because of his idolatry, because of his superfluity of naughtiness. And he tells us there the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 17. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 17. He tells us, be not over much wicked, but shall sir, Others before you have drunk to you. Drunkenness is bad enough. But to then go and take the vessels of the house of the Lord and drink out of that, that's been over much sinful, over much wicked, over much unrighteous. Even unrighteous people that are just moderately unrighteous, they are judged. Not to talk about people that go out and their unrighteousness overflow. The superfluity of naughtiness. It says, be not over much wicked. Neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? You see, before thy time, you are dying. Because you are over much wicked. Over much idolatrous. Over much having iniquity. And that's uh, what uh, Daniel was telling him. God has numbered thy kingdom. And he has finished it. And in the word, another word, many. It says, uh, many, many was repeated to show the certainty and the impossibility of failure. Because, and we're told in Genesis chapter 41, verse 32, it is doubled because the sin is established by God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. Belshazzar's kingdom, his glory and majesty, the years of his life on the throne and in the world, well numbered and finished. Does the sinner realize that his days are numbered by the decrees of heaven? Are we children of God too? Why sad than those people of the world? Do we realize that time is not going to continue forever? And that the time of the sinner, the backslider, that hardens himself in backsliding, his time, his life, his years of a court short. That's why we need to just turn away from following after Belshazzar and then we'll follow after the Lord Jesus Christ and live a life that God will be happy with and then God will prolong our days in Jesus' name. And we're looking at another word now. And let's come back to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. And Daniel was interpreting what he read. He had first of all said, many, many, that means the kingdom is divided now. Take him. Thou art wage in the balances and art found wanting. Thou art wage in the balances and you are found wanting. What does that mean to be wage? It means to be evaluated. It means to be examined. It's for God to scrutinize the life, examine the life, and look at the life very well and say, this is not up to the mark. You are wage in the balances and found wanting. Do you know that the Lord weighs our actions? He weighs our thoughts. He evaluates our lives. He finds out whether we're up to the mark or we're not up to the mark. Let's look at the word of God and, and support that or the scriptures. We're looking at First Samuel. In First Samuel, in First Samuel, I'm looking at uh, chapter two. For Samuel chapter two. And we're reading there from verse three. Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are waged, evaluated, examined, scrutinized, for God to see whether it comes to the level of the obedience that he expects of us. He says, by the almighty God, the God of knowledge, actions are weighed. We're looking at Psalm 62, verse 9. Psalm 62. We're looking at verse 9. Surely, men of low degree are vanity. 
And men of high degree are a lie to be laid in the balance, to be laid in the balance. They are altogether lighter than vanity. That tells you then that God is looking at everything that man is doing. Everything that people on earth that they're doing, both believers and unbelievers, and the Lord is evaluating and examining and weighing and is scrutinizing everything that we do to see whether it matches, it agrees with His word or not. In Proverbs chapter 16, we're reading from verse 2. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. People justify themselves and they say, I have a reason for doing what I did. I have a purpose, I have a goal for doing what I did. If I didn't do that, this will not happen. Well, you might have an earthly gain, but you'll have an eternal loss. Because when God evaluates, when God measures, when God examines, when God weighs, and when God scrutinizes your action, your life, your behavior, your practices, your profession, and then you become lighter than vanity, what are you going to do at that time? It says all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. The Lord weighs the spirits. So you find what God was saying. He found this man that he wasn't up to the mark. What a terrible sentence to hear on the last day on earth. This was his last day. And was just waking up to this surprise. He was stripped of all joy and satisfaction and hope as he faced an eternity bereft of all commendation and honor and peace. The law of God is a, is a test of human action. And when his life was placed in the balance of God's eternal unerring justice, he was found lighter than Vanity. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. We're looking now at verse 20. Paris. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Meds and Persians. And once again, let's look up for a moment. You know, Daniel was a real prophet of God. How do you know a real prophet of God? A real prophet of God will tell us the truth. Even when it is negative, bitter, unpalatable, unacceptable, unwelcomed. How do you know a false prophet? A false prophet is the one that tells us every time, he knows what we want to hear, and he tells us every time, not what God has said, but what we want to hear. And there are many of such prophets in our land, in our continent, in Africa, and beyond Africa. They tell people what they want to hear. They don't tell us what we need to hear. The sinner needs to hear that except you repent, thou shalt likewise perish. The sinner needs to hear except he man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. The sinner needs to hear the wages of sin is death. The sinner needs to hear that sin will end up, sinner will end up in hellfire on the day of judgment. We don't want to hear that, but that is the truth. But the false prophet never tells us what we need to hear. But not Daniel. Daniel told Belshazzar what he ought to hear. Not only that, you know, there was a promise attached to reading the writing. There was a promise attached to interpreting the writing. If anybody will interpret, will read this and interpret it, there are three things we're going to do for him. Number one, we're going to clothe him in scarlet, and then there'll be a chain of gold, and then we'll promote him national award. And we're going to give him the third position in the land. And you know, there are people just because they are running the race to have all those material things, the money, the gold, the riches, the wealth, the appreciation, and the exaltation of men. Because of that, they will not tell the truth. Because if they told the truth, 
people will not appreciate them. And the thing that the king had promised, they will not be able to receive. And they want that thing like Gehazi, like Balaam. They want the gain of unrighteousness very much. And therefore they cannot tell the truth. But Daniel is teaching us a lesson. Daniel is saying, let your gift stay with you. Give your gifts to another. All the same, I will read the writing. I will interpret it. Unto you. That's the mind we ought to have. That we need to tell the truth to the people. And if you are a pastor in a church, you need to tell the truth to the members of the church. A pastor is not a politician. Politicians are the people that, you know, they want to say, they don't say the right thing. They say this way and say this way so that they can be voted for another time. Pastors don't need votes, appreciation, smile, whatever. Pastors just need, they need to just listen to God, look at the word of God and give it to the people. If you're a pastor, you're the Bible study, you're listening to the word of God, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Don't be a politician. Daniel was not a politician. Am I right? He spent so many years in Babylon. He never, never, never mingled himself with those politicians. And he never became a politician. Every time he interpreted the word and gave them what they ought to hear. We well, thank God for our church. I said, we well, thank God for our church. The pastors here, the overseers here, the preachers here, the leaders here, they tell the truth. And we're going to have a retreat starting next week. You are going to be there. And you will hear the truth. You know, in all the, all the various locations, in the regions, and in the states, and the nations, where we go to have our retreat, the great men will be there, the, the big men will be there, and the elites will be there. But our preachers are going to tell the truth. They're not going to look at the face of anybody like Daniel. We're going to tell the truth convincingly in Jesus' name. Now it comes to verse 28, Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. You see, he was very definite and he said, this is what is going to happen. And uh, let's look at it. We've read it a word, bit of that before in the introduction. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. You will find something in Daniel. Everything Daniel said, you can go back to other parts of the Bible and confirm it. That's how you know a real preacher. Everything that Daniel said, you can go back to Isaiah. Isaiah will say, yes, that's the prophecy. You can go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah will say, yes, that's the prophecy. If you're a real preacher of the word of God, we can go back to the word and we'll find that what you have said and what you are preaching, we'll find it confirmed supported totally completely by the word of God in Jeremiah chapter 51 we're looking at verse 11 Jeremiah 51 verse 11 make bright the arrows gather the shields the Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes and, and for his devices against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. And so you find that we can see that everything that Daniel prophesied, what he read and what he interpreted, you find supported with the word of God. We come to point number two, the immediate fulfillment of an unchangeable prophecy. Let's come to Daniel Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 29 and verse 13. Daniel chapter 5, verse 29. Then commanded Belshazzar, and he closed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In Bastachi, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. It is something very serious in verse 29. Very, very serious that you need to pay attention. 
Daniel had just interpreted, read the writing, and interpreted the dream. And if you look at what Daniel said in the reading and the interpretation of, of, the, of the writing on the wall, rather, writing on the wall, if you look at what he said, he said, number one, the kingdom finished. And the kingdom is divided and is given out. You have lost it. And the question is, Belshazzar, do you believe that? Do you believe that God has numbered your kingdom and finished it? If you believe, you will not be given the position of the third, of the third ruler unto anybody. If you knew that tonight everything was finished, you didn't believe. And there are many people like that, they hear and they don't believe. And then it says that you are weighed and found wanting. And that the kingdom is already divided into parts. Parts given to the Medes and the part given to uh, the Persians. And then it says in verse 20, in verse 28, and it's given out. You've lost it. Now, if you don't have any money in the bank account, how can you be writing checks for people? If you don't have any property, how can you be distributing that? You see, the problem that people have, they do not believe the word of God. Belshazzar did not truly and fully believe. That's why he said, well, I made a promise to you that if you can read it and interpret it, I'm going to give you this and give you this and give you this. You know the problem on his last day, day on earth it was busy with administration administration instead of falling on his knees instead of saying Daniel what will I do if the kingdom is gone if I'm weighed and found wanting can you talk to me about the mercy of God about forgiveness about salvation if I'm going to die can you tell me how I can face eternity no question administration and there are people that are so busy they are workaholics they work and work and work and even when their life is not all right and even when judgment is sinking on their neck and on their head instead of saying what can I do to have mercy what can I do to have forgiveness and what can I do to have the salvation of God what what can I do so I don't miss heaven? They are busy. Administration, administration, administration. And what a terrible thing about this man. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 12. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 12. For man also knoweth not his time. Belshazzar, do you understand the interpretation? Do you know your time? And do you know that tonight you are going to die and the kingdom is taken away from you? And what's the best thing you should be doing now that you know the kingdom is gone and your life is weighed in the balance and you're found wanting? You're going to be ushered into eternity and you are not ready. Administration is not necessary at this time, Belshazzar. All that you are giving to Daniel does not hold any water, does not have any value. Making him a third ruler in the kingdom. The kingdom that is divided and finished and gone. It has no meaning. We need to evaluate our lives. If we are very close to eternity. If we are very close, let's say somebody, for example, you are beyond 70 years of age, 80 years of age, 90 years of age. And then you are sick. And you're not thinking about eternity. All you're thinking about is the house there, and the land there, and the documents there, and then my granddaughter there. Think about eternity. This is not the time for administration. And you know, there are some people too who are even church workers and church leaders. Very close to eternity. Very close to the time of Christ. They exaggerate church administration above salvation. Above restoration from backsliding. Somebody is backsliding. And you need to pray as the number one urgent thing that you ought to do. And instead of concentrating on how do I get back to God. How will I be restored into salvation? How will I have favor of God? Again, they abandon the necessary thing. One thing is needful. Choose that. 
and think about heaven. But no, administration, administration, administration. Belshazzar was occupied with administration at the very time he was about to die. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. Order your priorities right. Don't bury yourself in work, work, work without getting ready to meet the Lord your God. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. As the partridge seated on eggs and hasheth them not. So he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be, shall be what? Shall be a fool. I pray you'll not be a fool. I want you to look at Psalm 146 and 146. There are people that very near the grave, very near eternity. They are, they are imagining, they are meditating, they are planning, they are strategizing. How can I add this to that? How can I multiply that? How can I increase my resources there? How can I make that to grow? They are very near eternity. But they don't think about eternity. All they think about their thoughts, their thoughts, their thoughts. How can I get this done and get this done? That's what the devil does to some people. And when he does it to church people, it is terrible. When church people don't think about eternity. And all they're thinking, my thoughts, success, happiness, wealth, prosperity. And yet they're very, very close to the end. Psalm 146, we're looking at verse 4. His breath goeth forth. He turneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, we're reading from verse 18. Luke chapter 12, verse 18. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. When you think about this, this man was still strategizing and planning, meditating and, and kind of calculating. I'll build greater bands, I'll transfer this to this place, I'll get this done, I'll get that done without preparing for eternity. That's what happened to Belshazzar after he had the interpretation of the writing on the wall. Instead of asking, I want, I want to get my ways corrected. I know that the Almighty God, He pardoned my father, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar still came back to the favor of God and came back to the throne. Is there something you can do for me, Daniel? Instead of just interpreting and leaving me like this in the middle of the judgment. Can you pray for me? Can I have the mercy of God? I'm willing to repent. He didn't do that administration. And then he said, now you give him the clothes and you put the chain on him. And you over there get uh, something there that will show that it's not the third ruler in the kingdom. And while he was doing that administration, then the meets uh, people, they came in and they slew him and he died. I'm just reminding you of all this so that you're the wise in Jesus' name. So that you don't just listen to all this and then go back. And, and some people do that, you know. They come to the Bible study and God challenges them with something in their lives. 
and says this must be put right. This must be put right. Instead of doing that at the right time, saying, oh Lord, I know you are a God of mercy. You are going to forgive me and cleanse me and wash me and put me with the blood of Jesus. Make me whiter than snow. I want to get to heaven. Instead of doing that, they just brush it off and they continue in their administration. Continue in their work. Handicare kind of habit. Don't allow work to kill you. Don't allow administration to kill you. Come back to the Lord and say false things false. Seek it for the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and then this sin shall be added unto you. This man Jesus said, God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who, then whose shall these things be, those things be which thou hast provided? The Lord wants us to be wise. You'll be wise. I said you will be wise. Now we're told, let's come back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 5, we're looking at Bastachi. Let's see what happened to him after his, uh, you know, administration. Busy with distributing this and promoting that and exalting that. Now in verse 30 it says, In that night, that same night, was Belshazzar slain and was ushered into eternity without a moment's preparation. He was slain. And that was according to the scriptures. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. You will know that this is what had been prophesied and reaching ahead of time. Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 24. In verse 24 it says, Here it is, I have laid a snare for thee, O that thou art also taken, O Babylon, and thou was not aware. That's the problem. You are taken, you are judged, you are trapped, and the meats are just behind the gate, and you are going to be destroyed, and thou was not aware. Thou art found and also caught because thou was striven against the Lord. Because he had striven and fought against the Lord, that's why this came upon him. Jeremiah chapter 51, I'm reading from verse 56 and verse 57. Jeremiah chapter 51, looking at verse 56, because the spoiler is come upon her, even upon Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of the every one of their bows is broken. For the Lord God of recompenses shall surely require in verse fifty-seven, and I will make drunk her princes and her wise men, her captains and her, her rulers and her mighty men and. They shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake. That means they'll die and then they'll not resurrect at that time. It says, then says the king of whose name is the Lord of hosts. The Lord is calling us and is saying we shall be men and women of understanding so that we will not allow this to happen unto us. It will not happen to us in Jesus' name. If it's not going to happen, what do we need to take care of? Let's look at Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. Habakkuk chapter 2. We're looking at verse 3. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. In the case of Belshazzar, it was the appointed time of that very night. In our own case, we don't know when the end will come. When death will come, when the rapture will take place, it's an appointed time. And it says, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. It will surely come, it will not be delayed. In Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 29. So ye, in like manner. When ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is night even at the doors. Even at the doors. The Lord had been talking about the signs of his coming. And as you look at the New Testament and look at the signs that Jesus mentioned, those signs 
are being fulfilled right before us. If you're listening to current affairs, if you're looking at what's written in the newspapers, if you're listening to the radio, you're listening to the news in any way, you know that these things, they're happening in quick successions. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, when you see all these things happening, you know that it's very near, even at the door, verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour, no as no man, no, Not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Therefore, nobody knows the exact date, the exact day, but we know it's very near. And it says, take heed and watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man, taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening, or at midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, what's the word? Watch. The Lord is telling us to watch. We're looking at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34. What Belshazzar failed to do is that he didn't watch. He didn't take caution. And he didn't take heed. He didn't look at the word that Daniel just told him and then meditate on that and do something about it. He wasn't idle. He was still doing administration. He wasn't idle. He still tried to fulfill his promise. He wasn't idle. He tried to give something. He tried to give something to Daniel. He wasn't idle. He was thinking about the kingdom. Maybe he was thinking, if I bring Daniel in, I'm first, and that's second, and he is third. Maybe Daniel will find a way to preserve the kingdom. Judgment has come. And the kingdom was not to be preserved. And therefore, we should be wise and just make sure we do the right thing at the right time. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 34. <clears throat> and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and cares of this life. That's what I spoke to you about cares of this life. Administration is part of that. Organization is part of that. Doing this and doing that is part of that. Joining this with that strategizing and developing and working and working and working without prayer. That's part of that. It said the cares of this life. Then it says in that verse 34, so that they come upon you unawares that it came upon Belshazzar. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that that she may be count, accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I pray that you'll escape the judgment in Jesus' name. We're looking at the third point now, the inevitable future of all unconverted people. All unconverted people. What can we say about Belshazzar? There's one word we can use for him. He was unconverted. What's conversion? Conversion is change. There was no change in him. He was a drunkard before. He just went into more drunkenness. He was profane. He went into more profanity. There was no conversion. He didn't have any conversion. And for those who are unconverted, those who remain in their sin, it's what happened to Belshazzar that will happen to them. The inevitable future of all unconverted people. Daniel chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. In that night was Belshazzar king of the Chaldean slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. He took the kingdom, took the kingdom. Have you noticed, look up for a moment, brothers and sisters, have you noticed when, uh, for example, there is a coup in some of these countries, 
and the head of the government is deposed. His ministers and cabinet, do they have any place? Tell me out loud. No. The new leader will just come, brush everybody aside. And you will find then that when the Medians, when they, the Medes, when they took the kingdom and they killed Belshazzar, all his cabinet and all the people, they didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. And they didn't have any position anymore. And then you say, but how about Daniel? The third position was not of value anymore. Because all that was gone. Because what the new person did now, if you go to chapter 6, you'll see that he had his own cabinet now. And then he chose 120 princes. And then he chose three presidents. And then he gave Daniel one, two, or three. What did he give him? Number one, what the world Beshasa gave is nothing. You know what I'm telling you? Don't think about what the people of the world, what they have promised you. If you will remain faithful to God after they are gone, you will still be alive. And be something better than what they try to give you is what God is preparing for you. But if you embrace and you hold on to and then you forsake God because of the gift that is coming from Belshazzar, then God cannot give you anything. Leave their gifts to them. Those sinners, those idolatrous people, those people that are profane. Leave all their gifts to them. When God wants to promote him, man, he'll give you better than Belshazzar ever gave Daniel in Jesus' name. But now, Belshazzar gone because he was slain. And then we're told that this man took over. He died. But he wasn't the only one that died. Many other people too died. And uh, if Jesus tarries with you, we will die. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men wants to die. But after this, what? The judgment. After this, the judgment. That tells us then that judgment comes at the end of death, after death. What kind of judgment is that? Let's look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16 from verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and he and it, it uh, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that she may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame but Abraham said son remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented beside all this between us and you there is a great God fixed so that they which would pass from there, from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from this. It was an irreversible situation. Once somebody is dead, that will be the final sin. That's why the Lord is calling us to wisdom. Death is an awful sin for those who possess all the things of earth, but they have nothing in heaven. Though men do not think often about it, but they must die. Death will come. God will not give immortality to men on this side of heaven to spend in disobedience and in dishonor and disregarding him. Sinners live in constant fear of death, yet they do not turn from their sins to receive forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life from God through Christ. They put 
repentance far away from them, from themselves. But they cannot put death far from themselves. The ungodly may avoid Christ and his cross, but the ungodly will not be able to avoid death and the grave and judgment. The question is, because I've been concentrating on this Belshazzar, that he, he didn't prepare, he didn't do the right thing. You ask him a question, people of God, did they prepare, did they do anything before they die? If God told you that you were to die tonight, what would you do? If God told you that, <coughs> excuse me, you have just one day to live, and that you're not going to live for another week or another month that your time is up. What are you going to do? You see the people in the Bible they did something because they were wise. The Lord told them your time is up. And you need to get something done. And that's the wisdom the Lord is giving us that will not be as foolish as Belshazzar in Jesus name. Give me a good amen. Amen. I, I'll show you now. Look at Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. You see, the Lord wants us to prepare. He says, this is the end. This is the time. And you're about to cross to the other side of eternity. And then he told Moses in Numbers chapter 31. Look at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel, of the Midianites. Afterward, thou shalt be gathered unto thy people. He said, Moses, your time is up now. You are about to die. But I have an assignment for you. This you must do before you come over. And if he told Moses that, and he said, this is what you do. Before you cross over, you ought to be asking yourself, if this were my last day on earth, and I were to die tonight, what should I put in place? What should I settle before I go to meet the Lord? Look at verse 3. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm yourself, have some of yourselves unto the wall, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. That tells us then we need to prepare to meet our Lord. I'm looking at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're looking at verse 45. The terrible thing with Belshazzar is that he didn't prepare what to do. How to live. How to have forgiveness. How to have salvation. How to have the mercy of God. How to prepare for eternity. Before he died. And the Lord is saying, don't you act like that. Finish what the Lord wants you to do. Anything to repent of, do that urgently. Any decision to make, do that urgently. Anything to put right in your personal life, your relationship with the Lord, do that or gently, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 45. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words unto Israel. All Israel. And he said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. You see, Moses was a leader. He knew about the children of Israel. And he wanted the children of Israel to uh, comply with the word of God as a leader. That's all he wanted. And that's the commission the Lord had given him. And before he died, he needed to search all that. Have you searched your family to make sure that your children, they know the Lord before you die? That they obey the word of God before they die? And then you tell your children, this is what, this is what you, that's what you do. And set your house in order. And don't just leave everything so scattered, no spiritual thing in the family. Then you go. Or if you are a pastor, to make sure you set the doctrines and the word of God right before you go. And then we're told in verse 47, for it is not in vain, it is not a vain thing for you. Because it is for your life. And through this sin, ye shall prolong 
long your days in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord spake unto Moses that self same day, saying, Get thee up unto the mountain of Abarim, and unto the Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession, and die in the mount whither thou goest up and be gathered unto thy people. You see that he was prepared. I pray that when it comes to our tongue, we are prepared in Jesus' name. You are not going, everything so scattered, your life not right, guilt, condemnation, backsliding, sin, and evil, all over covering your life on, on page depths. And then after you are gone, people are saying, no, you know, you lived a bad life and a kind of unrighteous life and unholy life and ungodly life and now it's gone but she wants to set things right before you ever leave look at second peter chapter one second peter chapter one i'm reading from verse 13 second peter chapter one verse 13 yea i think it meet as long as i'm in this tabernacle to stir up your to start you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put up this tabernacle. You see these people of God, when it was time to go, they were not like Belshazzar, not ready, not saved, not sanctified, not holy, and not committed to the work the Lord had given them. But Peter said, I think it meet and suitable as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Then he says, knowing that shortly I must put up this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my disease, after my departure, to have these things always in remembrance. That's the path of wisdom. We're looking at Second Second Timothy chapter 4. In Second Timothy chapter 4, here is Paul the apostle. He too was prepared. Be ready. Be prepared. Make sure that there's no sin hanging on you. Defiling your conscience. Make sure that there's no backsliding. That salvation, salvation is indisputable. Undoubtable. That it's there, firm and confirmed. And that that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord is there in your life before you go. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 5 and verse 6. But watch thou in all things. It was giving instruction to Timothy, his son in the faith. As he did to all the churches. It said... That Timothy shall watch in all things and in the affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of the ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Because I know that the time of my departure is at hand, Timothy, let me teach you before I go. You know, he wasn't busy about secular things or important things, but about very important things. Come to John chapter 13. We're going to look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. When Jesus knew... That his hour was come. Have you noticed that from chapter 13 of John to chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, all Jesus did was training and teaching and touching the lives of his disciples. He led the Pharisees to be Pharisees. He led the Sadducees to be Sadducees. And he concentrated on his own disciples because he knew that was going and when you know the time is near, you're going to be wise and you're going to concentrate on essential things. You will not be dealing with superficial things, ephemeral things and things that are passing away, but things that are essential when you know that your time is at 
hand. That's what these people in the Bible, that's what he did. I've read to you about Moses, that's what he did. I've read to you about Paul the Apostle, that's what he did. I've read to you about Peter, that's what he did. And I'm reading about the Lord Jesus Christ, a perfect example. That's what he did. When you know that your time is near, and the time could be near for anybody, you'll concentrate on the essential, important things. You're not going to be spending your time on, you know, non-essentials, on just administration, on just this. You make sure that first of all, your life, you're forgiven, you're saved, you have the assurance of heaven. You know that if the trumpet sounds today, you know that by the grace of God, you'll be able to go. And then you know that you lay everything upon the altar, you're sanctified and purified and purged. You are cleansed by the blood of Jesus and that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord has been imparted, imputed unto you. And you're a possession of that thing that the Lord has given. And then you're saying, Lord, what else will I do? What else shall I do? And whatever it is, the Lord wants you to you do it very quickly because you know you might leave anytime. You'll not be dragging your feet and delaying things when you know the time is at hand. You'll not be doing like Belshazzar that is still giving gold to somebody and a purple dress to another person and a third position to another person where you know that your time is at time. John chapter 13 verse 1 now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should, be, he should depart out of the world unto the Father having loved his own that were in the world he loved them unto the end. Look at verse 34. He began to now instruct his own disciples to correct the terrible things that have been in their lives. All the arguments and the lack of love and the lack of submission to the word of God. He needed to settle them on all that before he left. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. As I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. See, we have love one to another. The greatest of all fruits, he gave them that. He said, before I leave, hear this one. And then he comes to chapter 14. Then he comes to chapter 15. Then he comes to chapter 16. Then chapter 17. He prayed for them that God will sanctify them, purify them, purge them, make them holy. After he settled that, now chapter 18 verse 1, when Jesus has spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Sidron where was he guarding into which he entered and his disciples and Judas also which betrayed him knew the place for Jesus of times resorted thither with his disciples Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees come thither with lanterns and torches and weapons the Lord had such a what he needed to settle now he could say bye bye to those the disciples and then face the death that the Lord had called him to, to be a substitute and our savior for us on the cross of Calvary. The question to you is are you that ready? Are you that ready? Are you settling it every night? Should the rapture happen before tomorrow morning? I need to search everything tonight and make sure that everything is in order and then you are ready to go. I pray none of us will be missing on that day. I said you'll not be missing on that day. Well, the, the beauty of it is that with all these studies, we become ready. You see, Belshazzar was not ready. Question to you is, are you ready? And the Babylonians were not ready. Are you ready? Balaam's of today. That because of covetousness, they want days and one days. And even when the angel is saying, your way is perverse before me. They still continue in seeking the gain of unrighteousness. Balaam's are not ready. Are you ready? The blasphemers are not ready. Are you ready? The betrayers like Judas is cannot, they are not ready. Are you ready? The backsliders are not ready. If you don't get restored and then get out of sin and come to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are not ready. Only the believers are are ready. The question is, are you ready? Those who are ready, they will have eternal home in heaven waiting for them. But those who are not ready, they'll have eternal horrors in hell. I pray you'll be ready. 
We're looking at Psalm 90, Psalm 90, verse 12, Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days. Lord, help us to get ready. That's why we'll come to the Bible study. A Bible study is not child's play. A Bible study is not for religious knowledge. A Bible study is not just for church tradition because church is doing it. A Bible study is to get us ready for the coming of the Lord. That's why after we've studied this, we're telling the Lord, so Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I pray that you'll pray that prayer. And God will make you wise, wise unto salvation. And if there's anything that will hinder you from seeing the Lord on the final day, I pray that tonight, before you go, you'll set your lead in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God will help you to be ready. God will help you to be ready. There's no other thing to do. Now, don't concentrate on other things now, like Belshazzar, like Belshazzar, looking into this and looking into that. Look at your own heart. Look at your own life. Will you be ready when the Lord will come? If you make carelessness a habit, that carelessness will continue until the day of death, until the day of rapture. If you make hardness of heart a habit, it will continue until the day of death. If you make negligence a habit, hearing it and not taking heed, if you make it a habit, it will continue until the final day. Don't let a bad habit ruin you, destroy you. Don't make it don't allow bad habit to make you a partner, a colleague, a friend, a follower of Belshazzar. Come to the Lord. You see Belshazzar, he overlooked, he despised, he rejected, he threw off all those prophetic interpretations that should have helped him. He should have looked at his life. He should have sought for the mercy of God. But he did not. That's why his judgment became inevitable, irreversible, unchangeable. But you can call upon the Lord today. You can ask the Lord, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. Make me whiter than snow. You know the scriptures. That's not the problem. It's now responding to the scripture. That's when God will have mercy. Check up your life. Lord, Help us to number our days and apply our hearts to wisdom. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Don't be a workaholic. Don't be drunk with work. Give some time for your spiritual life. Don't work and work and work to the point you forget the day of judgment and you forget to settle your spiritual life. Activity, activity, activity. Administration. Organization. Running up and down. Picking this and dropping this and tying up this and tidying that and building this and demolishing this and organizing this and doing this, assembling this. Don't allow that to take heaven away from you. 
put first things first. Salvation. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Make sure you are born again. Make sure the guilt is taken away, the condemnation is taken away. Make sure your conscience, your heart, your mind, your life, your spirit is washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Don't allow sin, immorality, iniquity, profanity, drunkenness, adultery, fornication to remain there. You're still busy and busy and busy. Getting this done, getting that done. When you hear the warning of judgment, come to the Lord. You don't have any excuse anymore. Belshazzar sure did not have any excuse anymore. He was warned. He was warned. But the responsibilities of leadership, of kingship, of royalty will not allow him to put his life right and straighten things out. Dutiful, but not saved. Active, but not born again. Energetic, but not righteous. First things first. The mercy of God is available. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Settle that first. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Settle that first. If we walk in the light, as is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Settle that first. My little children, these things are right unto you, that ye sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ the righteous. And then you can come to the Lord and plead the blood and repent and turn away from sin. And then it will wash you whiter than snow. Settle that first. Come now and let us reason together. Says the Lord, do your sins be as college and make them white as snow and do be red like crimson and make you as white as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Search all that first. Jesus also that he might sanctify the people suffered. Without the gate, let us go therefore, let us go forth unto him, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, settle that first. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, settle that first. Activity, administration, workaholics, without righteousness, without salvation, is dangerous, terrible habit. Not settling your personal life, personal relationship with God and just walking, 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 walking in church administration, church organization, kingdom administration, kingdom organization. Very dangerous.
give time to your spiritual life. The world concentrates on work. And they want to hinder the people of God from ever thinking about heaven. Don't allow the world to mold you into the personality of Belshazzar. Settle your spiritual life. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon when we return. Whoso covereth a sin shall not prosper. But she that confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Ask, seek, and knock. Let the Lord give you the assurance, the affirmation, the, com- the, com- the conviction, confirmation that you are right with God. Shall the Lord call you home today? You have that assurance, that confirmation in your spirit that you're settled, everything gets settled. Don't be unwise. We've learned so much today. We've just learned a lot. Isaiah prophesied it. Jeremiah prophesied it. Ezekiel prophesied it. Daniel interpreted it. But all the same, he was negligent. What he had planned to do before the interpretation is what he still did. The promise he had given before the reading of the writing and the interpretation of the writing. That promise is what is still followed. The program, the project he had in mind. That's what is still followed. He didn't allow the interpretation to change his plan, change his project, change his program. That's why I was lost. Let the study change your plan. Let the study change your project. Let this study change your program. From today, put spiritual things first. And make sure before you sleep every night, you are settled for the Lord. No anger, violence, fighting, stealing.